All right, so I think we'll get started here. Uh, welcome, I'm Jeremy Fricky with Tri Faith Initiative, and you are here for John and the Emir, uh, Muslim and Christian dialogue and debate in the seventh century. Hopefully I said Emir right. Uh, but uh, just so you know a little bit about Peter Miller, who's gonna speak with us today about this. Uh, Peter is a PhD candidate at the University of Iowa studying the religions of Byzantine and early Islamic Syria, Egypt, and Iraq. His dissertation is a study of competing educational models in Christian monasteries. Um, and he has received his Master of Arts in both Religious Studies and Classics at University of Iowa and a Master of Theological Studies from Vanderbilt. He has also participated in archeological excavations in both Israel and Greece. Um, so just so that we can hear the most we can from Peter, I will hand it over to him. All right, uh, thank you so much, Jeremy. And uh, thanks to Tri-Faith Initiative for the invite to talk today. Um, I am very, very excited to share with you all um, both a, what I feel is an understudied culture in Southwest Asian Christianity, as well as one of my favorite historical documents of all time. Um, definitely makes the top five. So uh, without further ado, um, let's get into this. So to, to start, before we talk about the document proper, um, I need to give what I have subtitled as a criminally short introduction to Aramaic Christianity. Um, and so in the next four minutes, I would like to introduce you to some of the core ideas, the geographic uh, spread, um, and some of the distinct features of Syriac Christianity, which is not a singular church, uh, but multiple churches all interacting and competing with one another, largely under uh, Muslim rule. Uh, I have here a map of the spread of Syrian, of Syrian and Syriac Christianity. Um, Syriac itself is a reference to a language, a dialect of Aramaic, uh, which had its start near what I've labeled as Arrow 1 uh, on the eastern Mediterranean, right in that southern border of what is now modern day Turkey, um, in and around the cities of Edessa and Antioch. Um, it spread uh, eastward both by land and by sea uh, with Christian missionaries, um, making it into modern day Iraq, um, Central Asia. Um, I've highlighted a couple places. Number two there uh, is Nisibis, which has a, a very prominent theological school uh, that I'm very fond of. Number three is Merv, home to um, a writer named Ishodad, who I also very much enjoy. Um, and its farthest extents, uh, moving east along what uh, people refer to as the Silk Road by land um, and by sea trade, uh, it reaches Xi'an in China, which we know because of uh, what is known as the Nestorian Stele. I have a little picture of the Syriac inscription on that under some Chinese characters above arrow five, uh, as well as into southern India uh, with a group of churches that are commonly referred to as the Thomas churches because of the legendary travels of Thomas the Apostle who goes out and founds churches in India. Um, Syriac is again a language. There are multiple churches that encompass this, um, but very early on, um, starting in the 4th and 5th centuries uh, CE, these churches fall out of favor uh, and communion with the Greek and the Latin churches um, of Europe and North Africa. Um, and so this is over a few things that we'll get into in the letter um, that we're going to read today, but I want to highlight four terms that are going to be very important for understanding our document today. The first of these is uh, miaphysite. Um, this is the dividing issue theologically between um, our, the Syriac church we're going to be studying and the Greek church, um, the Byzantine church, which is now the Greek Orthodox church. Uh, miaphysite comes from two Greek words that just means one nature. Um, one of the very, very divisive topics in the early church is how to describe what Jesus is, man, God, both, half and half. Um, and so the Miaphysite position is that Christ is of one nature. 
Um, and this is contrary to the decision of a church council in 451 CE um, at the Council of Chalcedon. Um, and the reason we're focusing in on the Miaphysites here is because our author is a Miaphysite Christian. This is the one of the core theological differences between the West Syriac tradition and the Greeks. Um, and so throughout the letter, any reference to our bishops uh, will be referring to this Miaphysite position, whereas the opposition party will be referred to as the Chalcedonians. Um, and when, so when you hear Chalcedonian, think Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic in this case. Uh, there are also two terms um, about Islam that are going to appear in this text as we read it. Um, one of the most common ones is Hagarene. Um, this is an early Aramaic term for Muslims, referring, of course, to um, Hagar, the concubine of Abraham, who fathers Ishmael, um, in order to try to fulfill God's promise of um, a large number of progeny following uh, Sarah's apparent barrenness. So Hagarenes uh, is a reference to children of Hagar because of the uh, surrounding legends that Ishmael would sire a large number of people and south of the re and he travels south into what we would refer to geographically today as the Arabian Peninsula and surrounding regions. Um, and so these children of Hagar is a term for Muslims, uh, but we'll actually see that this has become not an ethnic term for all Arabs, but a religious term to describe this movement um, of Islam. Um, and then Amir uh, in the title, uh, I glossed this as Muslim leader because that's the shortest version of it. Um, the emir is some kind of military political commander. Um, it's roughly equivalent to something like a governor or a prince. Uh, if you're familiar with the modern state, the United Arab Emirates, an emir rules an emirate, uh, much like a king rules a kingdom. Um, the most common English translation is going to be prince, duke, something along those lines. So with some of that background in mind and knowing that out of necessity, we have glossed thousands of years of culture and language, um, we're gonna come back to why simplicity is always the expert's devil in this talk multiple times. Um, uh, I want to introduce the text. Um, and so this text claims to be a description of the meeting John Cedra, the Miaphysite patriarch of the coastal city of Antioch, uh, who was the bishop there from 631 to 648. Um, and he's summoned to the court of some emir. The text doesn't name him, uh, but we know that it takes place on Sunday, May 9th, in order to answer some questions about Christianity. Um, and the author tells us that this was recorded, quote, shortly after it took place. And later commentary, particularly by uh, Dionysius of Telmare, uh, says that this is Emir Umayyar ibn Sa'd al-Ansari, uh, but this is two to 300 years after the fact, trying to explain the historical context about this letter. So we're gonna leave aside the specifics of whether this particular companion of the Prophet Muhammad uh, is in fact the Emir, um, but if you need a character to cast for your mind, um, this is Dionysius' suggestion. Um, if we take the letter at its face and we assume that this is an actual record of an actual conversation, it is then the earliest recorded discussion about religion between Christian and Muslim leadership, uh, which is itself is fascinating. Um, however, for reasons we're about to get into, this text probably wasn't actually written that shortly after this discussion took place if it did at all. Um, but through this talk, I want to highlight how we can learn both from the text if it is real and the text as rhetorical exercise. Um, my thesis about this text that I'm going to uh, attempt to persuade you of is that this is actually essentially a little tract or pamphlet for Christians to read to answer common questions Muslims ask about Christianity. It is anticipating questions um, as opposed to answering uh, specific ones from a real conversation. So when a scholar reads this letter, what we see are a few things. Um, I didn't do the math here. So, um, I am borrowing this uh, from Dr. Penn, who argues that uh, counting the calendar, 
this had to have taken place in either 633, 639, or 644, because those are the years when John was alive and a bishop, and May 9th was a Sunday. So if it took place, we are somewhere between two years after the Prophet Muhammad's death in 631, um, and uh, up to 13 years. But very soon after Muhammad's death, we're still in the kind of tail end of the first and beginning of the second generation of Islam. Um, we can tell that this is a Miaphysite text. Um, the author doesn't specifically say, I am a Miaphysite and, uh, but all the Miaphysite bishops are referred to as our fathers. Um, the thing that floors me about this book every time I look at it and study it is that one copy survived. We know it was widely circulated in the ancient world because we have so many commentaries referring to it or discussing this event uh, but only one copy exists, and it was copied by a monk named Abraham um, in 874, who collected a book of 125 demonstrations, collections, letters, um, useful miscellaneous documents. He basically copied over into a new folder and set it on a shelf for his monastery. So, based on comparing it with other texts, I'll gloss over the fine details. Um, this was likely written at the beginning of the 700s in the early 8th century. So the timeline for our text is an event that takes place um, within about 15 years of the death of the Prophet Muhammad, is composed somewhere around 100-ish years later, um, and then our copy comes from 874. Um, we are, as always with ancient documents, dealing with copies of copies. So this is a copy 100-some years later of this material. I have here a brief outline of the document. Um, it again is a letter from, an, uh, from a monk being sent off to other monks for reference. Uh, and in this, we have the setting the stage introduction. Uh, there are eight questions. We're gonna go through these one by one, so don't feel the need to memorize these immediately. Um, and then a final reflection and exhortation. So um, my primary interest with this document is to look at the models of early interfaith dialogue, understanding how these religions were talking to each other in the past, whether in a real or imagined space, um, and reflect on how we have advanced from and in how many ways we're still dealing with some of the same issues uh, in the modern world in Christian Muslim dialogue. Um, and we do have exactly one scene in which a Jewish person arri uh, arrives to offer some criticism. Um, so look, look forward to that. So after setting the stage, our monk tells us that uh, John Cedra, the Patriarch of Antioch, goes off and meets with the Emir, who has a series of questions. Through this document, this is going to be a largely one-sided conversation. The Muslim per, uh, interlocutors are going to be asking questions, and the Christians are going to answer. And the very first question is actually setting some nice ground terms. The Emir just wants to know, so is there only one gospel or not? Um, and for those of you who have looked at the Christian New Testament and have read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, the answer that yes, there is only one might be immediately surprising. But in this case, uh, gospel likely means collection of the four accounts. There is one sacred text. Um, you can probably translate this as much as one scripture here. Um, and he makes a point in particular, um, John Cedra does, that there's one, no matter what language you put it in, in Greek, for the Romans, for the Syrians, the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Indians, the Armenians, the Persians, everybody in every language. Um, and so this particular list essentially stretches us from Spain to India and south to Central Africa. So we're kind of getting a span of what the idea of the whole world is um, at this time in the 7th to 8th century. So nice establishing grounds. Um, I would like to offer uh, particular kudos to the Emir in this instance for just wanting to set some base uh, terms and conditions trying to understand what's going on. Um, and this is something that a lot of dialogue often tries to skip by. We assume we have the same text, we have the same terms. Um, However, uh, as much as I want to offer that support to the Emir, I also need to take a point away from John here a bit uh, because 
all these different churches he's referencing um, sometimes don't like each other, uh, sometimes have exiled each other from participating in each other's communions and deem each other heretics or no longer Christians. Um, and so there's a little bit of an assumption of what we might call a monolith to religion here. All Christians are just Christians, easy statement here, um, not really reflective of diversity on the ground. And we very quickly move to question two, in which the emir asks, if there's only one gospel, why are there so many different kinds of you Christians then? Um, he immediately jumps on this question of divergence. Um, and John's answer is very simple. He creates a metaphor and he says, well, the Torah is accepted by, uh, and he uses terms here, Christians, Hagarenes, Jews, and Samaritans. Everybody reads the Torah, accepts it, says it's true, um, but we all believe different things even though we're reading the same text. And he says, that's exactly how it is with Christians and the gospel. We can all read the same text and come to different conclusions. And so John actually expresses a surprisingly nuanced point here between both finding common ground as well as not getting overly lost in the fine detail. Uh, he's trying to simplify what's going on, um, a point we're going to get back to when we get into some of the very messy theology um, at stake in this conversation. Um, there's not an explanation of the, how these differing readings come about, um, but we see that this is reflecting a reality that's accepted by both. We've found a common term, we found something that can work, and we've moved on. So apparently satisfied by this question, um, the emir wants to move on to Christianity in particular um, and one of the major divisive points in Christian doctrine, which is who is Christ and is Christ God? The first half millennium and, and more of early Christianity is obsessed with defining exact creeds about trying to outline what exactly Jesus is, um, his relationship to God the Father, what the Holy Spirit is, how all of these can be God. And we, we might be familiar with these now in terms of the doctrine of Trinity, um, trying to understand these, um, but these are developing and still being articulated at the time. This isn't something that was immediately present and explained. And John's answer reads like someone who has very devoutly taken a Theology 101 class at the School of Nisibis. And that is, he says, and I have the quote here with a parenthetical asides that I've inserted, he is God the Father and the Word, born from God the Father, never without being, who took flesh and became man from Mary. And in so doing, he's actually citing two different creeds and theological disputations. He's not citing them, um, but again, in an attempt to simplify, he's trying to distill down what his church's position is as it stands at the present day without getting through the whole history. Um, so we won't dock him for plagiarism in this case. Um, and the two perspectives that he is presenting are that of two major um, third to fourth century theologians, Athanasius, who is arguing particularly that there was always a second person, a son of the Trinity, both before the creation account in Genesis and before the incarnation when Jesus was born in human flesh to Mary from the Christian perspective, as well as Cyril, who's involved in a long drawn out debate about whether when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, she was pregnant with God or with a man who God would later inhabit. Um, and so we're going to take a leaf out of John's book here and gloss over those fine, very nuanced details that um, I have taken full year-long classes on in order to try to explain and would likely still fail at this point. So we will move on. And it's that issue of pregnancy that John and the, that, uh, John and the Emir next turn to when the Emir asks, so if Jesus is God and Mary was pregnant with Jesus, who was guiding the universe while God was in Mary's womb? 
And so this is kind of one of these questions, um, a little bit like, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? We're trying to find some kind of theological catch. Is there here some hostility? Uh, possibly, but I, I choose to read this more as honest curiosity about how, how can you say that based on my understanding of what's going on? And like so many of my professors have done to me, uh, John decides the correct answer to this question is to ask a question back. And he says, all right, well, we've already established that we agree that the Torah is an acceptable source of material. So who governed the universe when in the Exodus account, God descends down to Sinai to speak to Moses and give the law? Now this question is trying to address some of the same issues about when God's in a particular place, how is he overseeing the whole cosmos? Uh, but we've turned it from a Christian particular over to an accepted common ground to which the emir then says, well, God is always the ruler of the universe. He was always doing it. He was in charge, even if he was in this particular place. Um, and then John says, that's exactly the same way when Mary was pregnant. Just because God in the person of Jesus was inside a human being doesn't mean that God wasn't steering the world. Um, we're going to do one more question before we take a brief diversion over to some of these issues of monotheistic interpretation to really hash out this major dispute in early Christianity and Islam. And so question five really tries to hammer a sensitive topic. What was the faith? What religion were Abraham and Moses? John offers a very, very simple answer uh, it is three words, both in English and in Syriac. They were Christians. Next question. Uh, but the emir doesn't let him get away with just that simple claim because for devout Muslims, uh, the true religion of God was Islam from the beginning. Um, and so devout characters in the Hebrew Bible were devout Muslims even before the revelation of Muhammad. And so the emir asks, if they weren't, if they were Christians, why don't we read about Christ in the Torah? Why isn't Jesus mentioned in the Hebrew Bible if these patriarchs were in fact Christians? Uh, the answer to that, that John gives, is one that relies on a common ancient metaphor that Humanity as uh, we might think of it now as, as a species, as a race, matures as a collective, just like we mature in individual lives. And so early in history, humanity is more infantile. It is less mature. And so John says humans just weren't ready for it because it's hard and we were already so prone to idolatry. But he says that the Torah still tries to, um, to foreshadow this with statements like we read in Deuteronomy 6, 5 here, here Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Um, we're gonna, you might not immediately say that, sound, that doesn't sound like Jesus is there, um, but I want to come back to that um, in a few slides. Uh, just hold on to that and the core assertion John makes over and over that Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit are not three gods, but one. And that really gets to one of the central Christian Muslim debates in the first centuries of Islam. And that is whether Christians are monotheists or polytheists, or potentially just idolaters. Um, and so I have here a couple graphics from the Wikimedia Commons that try to explain these. Um, the monotheism image is much simpler. Uh, there is a thing, it is God. Um, the Trinity is a little harder to explain. Again, we have centuries of councils trying to hash out how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, uh, but are not each other. Um, 
the person of Jesus is not God the Father, which is why Jesus can say, pray to God the Father in the garden before his crucifixion, um, and why Jesus can leave and then send the Holy Spirit that's not him to his apostles. Uh, there's a lot of work being done, and Islam, which reveres Jesus as one of the primary prophets of Islam, will simply say that this is actually the fundamental failing of Christianity in many ways. They have taken a human, a prophet, who was very good and very important, uh, but they have made him into a god. They are, idolater they are idolaters, having put up this human and made him into a deity. And so this reads a lot like someone who is anticipating that kind of critique, having ammunition ready to answer that question. Um, God is one, it says so here, not three. Uh, if the Trinity is not entirely clear uh, in terms of that, that's okay. Uh, there are reasons that many churches nowadays refer to how exactly three is one and one is three as a mystery of faith. Um, so we will leave that to the mathematicians to ponder. So we move then, um, continuing some of our hard-hitting questions, um, we move on to the emir really wanting to dig into this issue, and he asks specifically, where is Jesus written about in the Torah? And John here um, commits the great sin of Facebook debate and moves the goalposts. He says, oh, he's there, and he's also in the prophets. Now I'm going to quote a bunch of the prophets to you. Um, and so for those who might not be familiar, the Torah refers to the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, also known as the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the prophets are later writings. Um, the examples given here predominantly come from Isaiah. Um, but... John shows a bunch of these examples, and this is where I love the emir most in this document. He says, no, I asked where Moses talked about Jesus. I don't, I don't care about the prophets. We're going to go back to my question now. Um, I just very deeply feel for the emir in that instance of trying to keep the conversation on track. Um, and in an attempt to answer where, in fact, in the Torah, um, Jesus is mentioned. John goes to Genesis 19.24. This is the Sodom and Gomorrah scene. Um, and he quotes the line, the Lord brought down from before the Lord fire and sulfur upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah. And he says that this is a reference to Christ because the Lord is Christ. Um, and if we think back to our statement uh, from Deuteronomy on a previous slide, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Um, a little creative punctuation reading because ancient Syriac and Greek didn't have punctuation marks in the same way our languages do today, um, could read something like the Lord and God are one. Um, we're going to look at some of how that works out in translation. And at this point, the emir doesn't buy it and asks to read the text for himself. And so John produces two translations of the book of Genesis, Greek and Syriac. Um, and in this dialogue, a Jewish man is summoned to make a comment about the Hebrew text. Um, now, this is, I think, a very nice scene in terms of people having a discussion and disagreeing, trying to go to the text, reading it over, understanding what's going on, um, and yet, it's interesting that for someone who made the claim that the scripture is the same in every language as he did in question one, John now feels the need to cite multiple translations in order to show that it is consistent. Um, and so I want to briefly walk you all through how this transition from God and Lord is really taking place and is actually a result of the translation of the Hebrew text of uh, the Hebrew Bible. So in the Hebrew Bible, we see three principal names for God. Um, Elohim, the four letter divine name of God, which in English is often rendered as just an all caps or an all small caps Lord, 
um, and the word Adonai, uh, which is both said in place of the divine name by a devout Hebrew reader and uh, just used on its own and is just translated Lord or ruler. Uh, and so one of the fundamental questions is whether Elohim and Adonai are the same character. Uh, and a lot of first millennium um, and even into the medieval period, Christian readers don't think so. They are totally fine reading Elohim as God and Adonai as a prefiguring of Christ in most instances. Um, and so when we see the translations, we can start seeing why this happens and largely happens in communities that aren't reading the Hebrew. Um, in the Greek translation uh, known as the Septuagint, uh, the word Elohim is translated by the Greek term theos, which is just a generic kind of God. Zeus is a theos. Baal is a theos. God is a theos. Um, and the word Lord is translated by the Greek term kurios, which is just Lord. Um, but notice we now just have two words here because the Greek text doesn't like to try to render the four-letter name of God. And so anytime that that would be present, they instead substitute the word kurios, Lord, um, much like a devout reader wouldn't pronounce it. Um, I remember when I was learning Hebrew um, and there was an instance where there was a preposition on the name of God and I accidentally pronounced it and I was mortified for days because you're just not supposed to say it. Um, to the point where um, you might know the text from hearing as simply saying, Lord, 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 over and over again. And you might not be sure if the text actually says Adonai in there or if you're substituting the name. Um, and the Syriac actually does kind of the same thing, where any instance of Elohim is translated with its Aramaic equivalent here, Alaha, you might hear kind of a similarity to the Arabic term for God, Allah. Um, and the word Lord is Mara um, or Mar, which we also see attached to bishops and um, high-ranking monks. This is Lord, Sir, um, as a term. And so some of this confusion is probably coming in because we're collapsing three Hebrew names into two in some of these other translations. And this actually helps us understand potentially the somewhat unfortunate scene with the Jewish man who summoned forward because after looking at the Hebrew or after hearing about the Greek and the Syriac, um, the emir wants to know if it's also true um, in the Jewish scriptures, in the Hebrew version. Uh, and so he summons forth a Jew who is at his court and asks if that's the case. Uh, and the Jew simply says, I don't know. Um, and this may be one of those, is he just hearing the text? Is he unsure if this particular verse that this bishop pulled out of seemingly nowhere is actually referencing it? Um, if this is a later Christian author, he might not know how a Jewish interlocutor would respond, and so he doesn't attribute an answer to a Jew. Um, it's hard to say, but um, I do want to give a lot of credit here to the emir who, when wanting to know something, reaches out to someone of that tradition who is, in theory, an expert in that field, trying to understand it, trying to make sense of what is going on in the text. Because if both Jews and Christians agree on the Torah, but Jews don't read Christ into it, there is an explanation to be had, and the emir wants to find it. Let's move on to question seven here. Um, our interest has largely moved from that of first text and second theology uh, into one of law. And now the emir wants to know, uh, what is the Christian law? What rules do you live by? And is, is it written in the gospel? And how do you divide your property when a man dies? Um, to which John just says, yes, it's in the gospel, trust me. Um, this is a very short and frankly, I think the most disappointing question. Um, and on the heels of the previous few, um, this is the biggest letdown in the text to me is that the answer is just, yes, there is a Christian law. 
Um, but it has the single most interesting aside to me in that um, the author makes a point that there were many things discussed about this. He doesn't tell us what, just that they talked about law for a while. Um, and there were other Christians there. And he calls these three Christian groups there the Tanukaye, the Tuaye, and the Akulaye. Um, and these are actually known to be tribes of Arab Christians. Um, and this is where we can know some of the nuance around that term Hagarim being used because these groups are called tribes, they are called peoples, but they aren't called Hagarines. This is not being used as an ethnic term, it's being used as specifically a religious term for Muslims. Um, and these groups are uh, known to us because of contemporary bishops. Um, my particular favorite of this time period is George, who would have existed sometime between the time this conversation took place uh, and around the time it was likely written. Um, and our Syriac sources about George tell us that he oversaw those same three tribes. Um, it looks almost like these three groups become a kind of default for Arab Christians as a whole. Um, and it really highlights an, a surprisingly nuanced attempt to understand these groups of people. Um, and so I just really want to highlight that in the seventh century and in the eighth century, uh, we see our authors even trying to make careful distinctions of terms between a religion, a culture, a language, uh, they are doing their best, perhaps not always succeeding. Uh, I know I certainly don't always, um, but we see an attempt made, and I think that's a really important lesson to take from that text, trying to use the right terms. Our final question is less of a question and more of a demand in the text, in which the emir says, show me where the laws are in the gospel and live by them, or submit to Hagarim, read Muslim law. Um, this is a fairly standard practice. There are many accounts in the ancient world of a conquering people or a uh, people who come into power over another group who want to respect existing customs. Um, we can think to the Jews under Roman rule who prior to uh, the revolts that lead to the destruction of the second temple um, the Jews enjoy some amount of religious liberty um, under the Romans because their religion already existed um, and they could offer sacrifices and prayers on behalf of Roman rulers. Um, the Romans weren't the only to do this. Um, we also see a similar thing under uh, some of the Mongol rulers uh, later in history. Um, and so John decides he actually needs to show his sources this time. Um, which is good for John. Um, and so he says, Christians do indeed have good and upright laws, and you can find them in three places. There are the commandments in the gospel, the sayings of Jesus, and some of the um, commands that he gives to his apostles. Uh, the canons of the apostles, uh, which here are likely referring to the letters that finish out the New Testament um, in the Christian Bible. I think the writings of Paul, Peter, and John, um, as well as some of the surrounding next generation texts um, from early bishops and leaders, as well as uh, the laws of the church. So here we're seeing an appeal to the uh, church canons and the conciliar decisions, even though we are divergent. This is the last question of the day, and the author says that the questioning ended for the day and people went about uh, their way. And at least for me, when I read that the thing finished for the day, I assume we're going to get a next day of questioning. Uh, that doesn't happen. We just get the one day. Um, I really was waiting for the sequel, but they haven't found it yet. Um, but our conclusion makes a couple really fascinating asides, um, much like those references to Arab Christians earlier. Our Miaphysite author says that also this whole time, there were Chalcedonians present. Remember, this is the rival theological faction. They disagree about Jesus. Um, and it says that both sides prayed for John since he was going to be the representative of all Christianity. 
Um, and so again, if true, this is a fascinating scene of people disagreeing within one tradition, deciding, okay, we might disagree amongst ourselves, but when meeting with someone we disagree with more, we're gonna present a united front. Let's talk to each other and support each other in this endeavor. Um, and the text ends with an exhortation for all the Christian readers to pray for the glorious Emir that God would enlighten and instruct him concerning what is pleasing to the Lord and is beneficial. This is particularly striking to me because unlike a lot of documents around this time, we aren't praying for the conversion of the Emir. We're not trying to talk to this person and convince them of the rightness of Christianity to such an extent that this person now becomes Christian. Um, it is instead kind of a recognition of the difference and asking that God still guide and instruct this person. Um, and I think here looking back to Jewish sacrifice on behalf of the Roman emperor is another instructive um, point of comparison here. Um, now we might, there might be some underlying, if he's going to do what is pleasing to the Lord and beneficial, maybe he will convert after all. Um, that may be underlying some of all this. Um, and that ends the letter. That is the brief read through and summary of the document itself. So I want to take a moment and reflect on some of the broad trends of the letter, some of its great successes and some of its great failings, both historically and as a model for modern um, interreligious dialogue. So one of the big failings of the letter as a model for interreligious dialogue here is the one-sidedness of the questions. This is really just an explanation of one religion's perspective. And now in something like a seminar format, um, that might be helpful, um, but we don't seem to have equivalent documents in Syriac Christianity trying to explain Islam to other Christians. It's a lot of how do I present myself. Um, and so there's, a, I think, a bit of a failing on that mark. Um, again, the text takes uh, three prongs to explain Christianity. It's in concerned with theology, text, and law. What there's not a lot of discussion about are concerns about things like the structure of the church. There's not a lot of description of liturgy or the practices of Christianity. It is really about the beliefs and apparent structures that should be guiding and leading Christians um, under Muslim rule. Um, but the text does try to provide a common ground um, and variously hits and misses some of those issues of unity versus division within a group. We see recognition of multiple groups of Christians and yet assertions that all Christians believe one thing or read the same text. Uh, and this really hammers in the fact that simplifying is always going to obscure something true for the sake of comprehensibility. Um, simplifying is a very, very difficult thing and John is here in this text trying to simplify a lot. Um, one thing that is really important to remember about this text is that translated into English, it is less than six pages long. So all this ground that we have covered in this dialogue, which we've been talking about for 45 minutes, really is contained in six very dense pages um, with a lot of background to be thinking about. So some of the uh, successes and failures to be aware of are that this is not a conversation taking place on an equal power dynamic. An emir is someone in political power and authority over their subjects. And this bishop is summoned to his court to explain potentially laying out some of the legal standards by which Christians will live under Muslim rule at the time. Um, the answers that John gives, um, while often technically true, um, I find fail to be persuasive in many instances, particularly as many times when he says, no, it's in the book, trust me, um, which as I will tell any of my students writing papers, anytime you need to say, trust me, please just cite your sources. 
a footnote is not that hard. Um, so we have this issue of trying to be persuasive and where John does get persuasive in laying things out is when he really lays out the text and they start talking about things. Um, and again, I wanna highlight that people are being summoned, whether it's a Christian bishop or this Jewish uh, person at court in order to explain and speak for their own traditions. And so giving voice to participants of that tradition has roots going back to at least the eighth century, if not back into the seventh, um, for uh, this kind of dialogue, even if it is an imagined dialogue, that means that the ideal form of this imagined dialogue would involve this kind of calling on others to give voice to traditions. Um, the last thing I want to really note about this disputation of John and Amir before I make a suggestion on something you might write and we turn over to questions and answers is that um, within the structure and history of this time period, it's worth remembering that this is a Christianity and Islam that are pre-Crusades. Um, we have not yet launched the, seen the first crusade launched against um, Muslim held cities. This predates um, some of those wars, though we have had wars against Byzantine Greeks along the way. Um, and so there are very, very many sources that are less generous on interreligious encounter between Christian and Muslim here. Um, and uh, this book here, When Christians First Met Muslims, is a fantastic resource um, by Michael Philip Penn. Um, it is a short introduction and very accessible translations of some of the earliest source materials on Christian Muslim interactions. Um, my English translation of the text for this talk is based on um, Dr. Penn's uh, work here. And the source material within it ranges from these kinds of letters to apocalyptic visions of the Muslims as conquering forces that are ushering in the end of the world, which was a Christian response to uh, Muslim expansion. And so uh, before I turn it over to questions, I want to thank everyone again for coming today. Um, this turnout was amazing. Um, I am so delighted so many people wanted to come here um, about these talks. Uh, and as much as I am trying to give John a pass on the complexities of simplifying complex issues, uh, I admit that in order to try to simplify a cultural, linguistic, uh, and document introduction, uh, I too have had to obscure many things. Um, so please feel free to ask questions and let me know uh, what I can do to clarify this text or the broad history surrounding um, these early interreligious encounters. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, we have a few questions coming and, and feel free to add more if you have any more. Um, the first question was, um, you said that book had a translation, an English translation of this text or is there another alternative? Or uh, yes, it is. Uh, I have here a quick scan of it. It is all English. That source book by Dr. Penn is entirely English language documents. Okay. Um, they are all translated into English and every individual document has an introduction both from which of the Syriac churches it's coming from, whether it's the Miaphysite West Syriac tradition, the East Syriac tradition, um, the Melkite tradition. Um, there are a lot of them. We were only talking about one. Um, and so it does a good job of highlighting and framing what's going on, as well as offering a short introduction to these texts. Um, you can actually find kind of a summary version of a lot of the introduction I gave um, in a couple short paragraphs that Dr. Penn has outlined here. Very cool. Um, another one is, um, is the term Hagarenes at this time, is that an offensive term? Is it a neutral term? So uh, this is an area of debate. Um, the etymologically, the origin of the Aramaic term here is disputed. Um, it is usually translated as Hagarin because Mahagara um, is likely linked to the lineage of Hagar. 
Um, but as we see in things like the Surah Ibrahim, there is a recognition of the lineage of Ishmael um, as holding part of that Abrahamic covenant. And um, many of the Hadith make specific reference to the Arabs as um, the kind of children of Ishmael, and um, that is their link to that Abrahamic covenant. Um, it is also possible that the Aramaic is finding Hagar in that by accident, because it may be referencing um, an, Arab, an Arabic term, Mahaja, which is referencing um, the Hajj in particular, the pilgrimage, um, which actually reenacts some of these scenes of Hagar and Ishmael um, running to and from the well and such. Um, and there's not a J in classical Syriac. Um, and so it might be that Ga, that Mahaga is trying to get at that Mahaja. Um, and so it might actually be an attempt to capture that Arabic self-descriptive term. Um, it's not entirely clear. Um, but I don't get the sense that the term is meant as offensive. Um, I don't think this is a slur. I think they are trying to navigate what terms to use, um, and this is the best they have found here. Um, there are much more offensive terms used in some of those apocalyptic uh, war writings that are not Hagarine. Thank you. Um, also, a couple other questions. Uh, Firstly, um, does, does the, the closeness of language, um, you know, between Syriac and Arabic, um, how does that impact interfaith or interreligious dialogue um, during this? Um, I think that one of the uh, most interesting points of that kind of contact actually comes in with Arabic interest in Greek writings. Um, as Baghdad is developing as a city, there is an interest in Greek philosophy and collecting in the House of Wisdom um, the world's um, greatest thinkers. And so um, many Syriac sources are tapped to, be, to both translate Greek into either Syriac or Arabic, and also to do this because most Syrian peoples living under Muslim rule are using Arabic as their day-to-day -day language. Um, while Aramaic has become a kind of liturgical language or kind of a family language in many instances. Um, and so you actually see those diverging language skills being purposefully exploited um, and requested from each other. We have receipts in books about um, emirs paying monasteries for translations of certain works of Plato and Aristotle, which is amazing to me. Um, but that, that closeness of language does lead to occasional issues of slippage. Um, both Arabic and um, Syriac Aramaic um, have a lot of similar roots, but their grammar is a little bit different. Um, and so sometimes what you think will be a noun is actually trying to be an Arabic verb. And so a whole sentence just get, goes wrong very quickly. Um, and like we talked about with the question of the term Hagarin, sometimes you just don't have the right letters for things. Um, and so it both leads to great opportunities for um, interesting conversation and development, uh, but also leads to uh, possibilities for confusion, which is why I really want to underscore that one of the first things the Amir does is try to get on a common terminological ground, really ground everything in terms of what do we mean by gospel here? Thank you. Um, also, uh, how one person asks, how did Muslim rulers treat Syriac communities in their midst in general? Yes, um, so this is a question that uh, changes ruler to ruler as so many things do. Um, generally speaking, um, Christians under Muslim rule were allowed to participate, perform their own rituals, continue to have their communities, and even in some cases um, allow their bishops to serve as judges um, so that you don't go to um, a Muslim court. Um, this is kind of the idea that you let people tend things in their own house, um, a common ruling tactic um, by many empires. Um, now that said, there is a kind of tax associated with participating in government uh, without being a Muslim. And so there would be some amount of tax levied for every church, every monastery, um, that is continuing to perform um, its duties, 
um, that would be slightly higher than any tax on Muslim um, establishments of equivalent uh, perspectives. Mosques pay less tax than churches. Um, and so there, is, there are periods that are described as ones of persecution under particularly zealous rulers, um, but the story of Syriac Christianity is actually one of a lot of common understandings. There is tension, um, which we see because there are concerns about Muslim rule and will there be exploitation? Are we going to see new waves of martyrdoms, people killed for their faith? Um, but there is a lot of just common ground and um, exchange um, with the slight downside of paying a higher tax to practice your faith. And um, do you think that the meeting that they're describing actually took place in any sense? Uh, the the thousand dollar question of the day. Um, I think that um, there was almost certainly when a new emir came to power in Syria, a meeting between some bishop and whoever that emir was in order to establish things. Um, and I think that this document is probably mythologizing or playing up or distilling down elements of some kind of real meeting. Um, so rather than trying to reflect exactly who that was and who might be there, this is probably a, um, a fictionalization um, of something based in reality. Um, that, that's my money guess, but we, ju we just don't have the documents to know for sure. Um, so I may, I may be wrong. I may be, I may be losing that wager. Um, it, now I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but I do want to uh, mention that in the chat, there is a survey that uh, we would love for you to fill out. Um, but uh, going on with uh, another couple questions. Um, one is, uh, if there is one lesson that you would bring from, from you know, studying this you know, in, in its whole um, to today's interfaith dialogue, you know, what do you think is the clearest lesson? Uh, I think the clearest lesson really becomes um, letting practitioners of a tradition have their voice, but also being open to questioning um, and exploring those claims. Um, and so I, I, I think that the real lesson comes in that question about um, is, is Christ back in the Torah? And there's, this is the point at which we see the greatest amount of actual dialogue and back and forth. Um, and I think that that is a very productive model, um, trying to understand and come to points of uh, commonality. And even if we walk away disagreeing, um, I don't think, for example, the Jewish man was convinced that, yes, in fact, every time I hear Adonai in Torah when I go to synagogue, all of a sudden, uh, I now know this is Jesus. Um, I don't think he comes away with that, but he now understands better, I hope, um, where Christians are reading Jesus in a shared text, or the Muslim ruler can understand a little bit better how Jesus might be able to be God and not. Um, and so calling experts, but being willing to um, ask them questions and really like interrogate at points and ask for clarification. Um, so I think that kind of combination of eagerness and uh, the humility to ask, just being willing to say, I don't understand this, help me, um, goes a long, long way. That's great. Um, and, you know, we have just a, about a minute or two left, but, you know, I'd like you to be able to kind of mention anything that, that you'd like to, you know, about the things you're researching or um, any of those things. Yeah, um, if I could give one major plug here, um, it is that um, though I study these Syriac churches as historical entities, these are still real and modern churches, um, largely based in Syria and Iraq, and with a lot of the um, uh, political situation, the wars, the insurgencies in those regions, large numbers of these Christian groups have been displaced um, and are among the refugees. and. Um, I would just ask people to be aware of that and know that this is an ongoing plight of um, these refugees displaced um, by these wars and um, conflicts. And 
obviously there are vast numbers of Muslim refugees as well. Um, but one of the problems we see with um, the attacks by groups like ISIS in, uh, uh, against Syrian churches is the destruction of libraries in the Syriac language. Um, uh, we don't know how many documents we might have lost ranging from people's birth certificates and baptismal records up to potentially lost historical writings that have been destroyed in these. Um, and I just want to let you know that um, as much as I am a historian, I study the ancient world. Um, these are real living people um, who still need help. Um, part of my work as a historian is trying to make sure we don't lose the story of these people who are displaced and refugees. Um, and so uh, I know there's a million places asking for your donations and gifts at this point, um, but consider helping some of these refugees um, in honor of this talk and what you have learned and this branch of understudied Asian Christianity that um, the narrative that focuses on things like the Protestant Reformation really kind of leaves behind. Um, and so what, whatever tradition you come from, um, I hope you can find some compassion for the refugees and um, what it is they might be losing and help them find uh, hope and home and comfort. Well, thank you again. I hope everyone enjoyed. And, and just a final reminder of the survey in the chat. Uh, if you have any individual questions, um, my email is just peter-miller at uiowa.edu. Please feel free to reach out. Um, provided it doesn't try to travel to my spam folder or something, I'll try to get back to you. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone have a great day.